Good morning to everybody. It's morning in Nigeria. And um, a warm good morning to everybody all over the world. As I have been introduced, the topic I'm going to be talking about is cleft speech therapy in the context of speech language therapy practice. I believe everybody can hear me. Hello? Yes, Prof, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, the first slide is about the object of our lecture. You know, the very candidate, the patient, we are sent to today's lecture on a child with either cleft palate or cleft leaf. Now, the objective of today's lecture include the following. Number one is to reflect on extant practice of cleft speech therapy alongside the speech language therapy practice in Nigeria. Two is also to identify some challenges and prospects of ESP, that is cleft speech therapy, stroke speech language therapy, to consider some far reaching attempts in order to chart out you know, a very better future for patients. And also to foster better understanding and cooperation among diverse professionals working alongside SLC and CSP practitioners. Now, I'm going to go through all this by following the outlines we have here. One, I'm going to talk briefly about the emergence of SLC and CSP. I think by now we are all familiar with what I mean by SLC. That is speech language therapy and also SSP, that is cleft speech therapy. Okay. So after we would have considered the emergence, then we move to what are the objectives of CSP and also SLC. Next, we'll be discussing some challenges of speech language therapy as well as CSP. And then finally, we'll be discussing some matters arising from numbers one, two, three. Thank you very much. Now we go to the emergence of speech language therapy practice as well as cleft, cleft speech therapy. Let me make it very clear from the beginning that of course both SLC and CST have similar de development. Their emergence, you know, their evolution are quite very, very similar. In fact, that of cleft speech therapy is subdued in the speech language therapy practice. Now, um, the probably the oldest book ever written on speech therapy was written by John Willey in 1894. And um, this book is important for three reasons. Number one is that, like I've mentioned, is very likely to be the first ever written book on speech correction. The title of course is Disorders of Speech. Number two is that the book helps us to trace the history, the origin of speech language therapy practice, particularly in the United Kingdom. And again, let me also stress that this book is also very important because after it was published, it initiated a widespread interest in speech language therapy, you know, as well as that of the cleft speech therapy. Okay. Now, let me also make it clear from the beginning that the practitioners of speech language correction are often called pathologists of therapy. Somebody asked the question, what's the difference between pathologists and the therapist. And of course, um, they do not mean exactly the same thing, but they describe an identity of people who take speech language correction as their vocation, as their job. Why 
can they be called pathologists as well as therapists is because their training involves three things. One, it involves an understanding of the nature of speech diseases or speech pathologies. Two, it also involves identifying or diagnosing speech, speech, um, speech diseases. And lastly, their training also involves rehabilitating people who have speech problems or speech um, disorder. Please, um, you can see that, of course, whether you call them speech pathologists or you call them speech therapy, they are very much qualified, whichever term you choose to use. Please, can we go to the next slide? Now, I'm still bordering on the history, the origin, of course, the emergence of speech language therapy as well as plus speech therapy. You will realize that in the beginning, two professions were major key players, you know, in the act or the practice of speech correction. And these professions are the teaching profession itself, as well as theater, you know, theatrical profession. Okay? There were two elegant actors in speech language practice. Before medicine got actively involved around 1945, and how medicine came in, you know, around 1945 was after the World War II, you know, especially the history of audiology and speech pathology in America, you know, the fact was there were so many veterans who returned from the war with injuries, particularly um, many of them lost the ability to hear and, and hear very well. And there was a need for them to rehabilitate their hearing. And of course, this has to be done alongside, you know, the uh, speech rehabilitation. And that was how Mexin got actively involved in the practice of speech language therapy. All over various centers in America, you know, we have what they call veteran centers where speech and audiologic um, services were provided. Now, um, we also need to stress it that in the early stage, especially before the turn of the 20th century, those who engaged in speech correction were people who didn't go to any formal school. They simply taught themselves by whatever means, because the emphasis at that time was, you know, on oratory, you know, voice training and um, speech correction, like I mentioned, particularly um, in the theater and the teaching profession. So, um, of course, like we have mentioned, the trend continues to grow and grow. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, in the next slide, we have some important landmarks in speech language practice, okay? 1940, uh, sorry, 1925, for instance, we have the establishment of the Department of Speech Therapy at the Central School of Speech Training and Dramatic Art in London. Please, I hope I'm not too fast for the interpreter. Okay. You are in good, sir. Thank you. Hello. It's I good. You well. It's good. Thank you. Okay. So please, I'm just tracing some important landmarks in the development of speech language therapy practice. Um, and I mentioned that in 1925, for instance, the Department of Speech Therapy and um, Speech Therapy was established in the Central School for Speech Training and dramatic arts in London. In 1926, as well as also 1932, you know, there was the establishment of the hospital-based schools of speech and language therapy in London. Again, 1935 and 1945, establishment of the Glasgow School of Speech. And 1945, we have the College of Speech Therapy, in the United Kingdom. That college was renamed College of Speech and Language Therapy in 1991. And again, that college was again renamed Royal College of Speech and Language Therapies. 
1995. Please, can we move to the next slide? Okay. Now, having traced the development of speech language therapy practice in um, Western world, we'd like to come, you know, to Africa, particularly in, in Nigeria. Um, let me mention that in 1977, the unit of the speech pathology and audiology was created in the Department of Special Education at the University of Nevada. That unit began to train speech patholo um, pathologists as well as audiologists since that time. And what happened was that the graduates from that course eventually became the pioneer workers, you know, employed as speech therapists in various hospitals in Nigeria and also in Africa. I realized that some people came from Ghana, Togo, um, Cameroon, you know, um, especially Donna State in 1987 when we graduated and um, they took, you know, the idea back to their country. And today we have so many um, departments of speech pathology and audiology in various universities in some West African countries. Okay, so like I've mentioned, from that time, the program developed or really progressed from that of undergraduate education to postgraduate education. So today you have postgraduate levels, you know, at master's and PhD levels. And the important thing, like I've mentioned, is that the graduate, of course, started what we call speech language practice in this country. As I'm talking to you, almost 95% of speech therapists all over the country in, in different, you know, work settings, be it public or private, happen to be the product of this department. The good thing is that we also have so many, many universities or colleges that have also started running the program. I think the, the latest is from the University of Medical Sciences in Nondo, which has started a full-fledged department of speech pathology and audiology. Now, let me also mention that in the recent time, we have some foreign trained speech therapists who are now complementing speech language therapy practice in the country. Please, can we go to the next slide? Now, the fact is that having started from Europe down to Africa, particularly Nigeria, the issue is that speech language therapy, including cleft speech therapy, which started as more or less a circumstantial vocation, you know, few decades ago, have now become an essential profession in our modern days. Okay? It's, you know, began as a response to a demand for a docile, efficient, and just productive speech. It has now become more central to the industrial and democratic operations of our modern society. What are we trying to say here is that speech language therapy has become a vital very essential, very important profession of practice in our modern time. Um, take what, I mean, look, for instance, at this quotation from Pierre and Pierre in 2018, you know, speech was no longer a skill perfected by the political and industrial allies, but has become a productive capacity central to the American democratic and industrial society. Speech was necessary and is also still necessary for normal psychological and intellectual development and was and is understood as the greatest weapon of man's brain in the fight for advancement. Changes in industry and technology render speech an important economic capacity. That is the status of speech language um, therapy in our modern day. Now, what are the goals? You know, why do we engage um, therapeutic measures in treating patients or rehabilitating patients either with, you know, specifically with um, cleft problems, you know, cleft lips or palate, as well as those with other speech language challenges, you know. The fact is that, well, when you look at cleft matter 
specifically, you find out that there are two major language problems with them. One is absence of quality voice or voices, and also improper articulation. And the goal, you know, for rehabilitating them should also be to ensure pro, um, a quality production of speech, particularly that of good voicing by creating a new motor speech patterns which replace speech plant error. And again, we also engage in speech therapy to make sure that we initiate correct articulation. Um, I will speak more about that you know, later on. Now, again, if we move from, you know, CSD, that is club speech therapy, we move to the larger scope now, um, speech language therapy. So you find out that the goals are many there. Why is this profession keep on growing and growing? That in the recent time, the statistic has it that um, the prospects, you know, employment prospect of speech language therapy is about 25% between 2019 to 2029, you know. These are some of the issues people have now come to realize that there is, you know, the need for improving, improving verbal and non-verbal media of communication, promoting self-esteem, human dignity, achieving clear, flawless and pleasant speech so that the speaker is well understood by the audience, okay? Eliminating frustration, avoidance and other psychological problems. We all know that whoever has speech problem has a lot of psychological problems. And the range, you know, um, is quite very concerning. If the problems are not corrected or eliminated, it keeps on creating frustration, lifelong frustration for the patient. Okay? So please, because of time, can we, I will discuss more about that. Can we go to the next slide? I also like to plead for your indulgence that the next slide on matters arising from the history of speech language therapy, as well as cleft speech therapy, um, for now, be suspended. I will discuss all matters arising together. I think it's better that way. Please. Um, the ICT man or woman dear, please. Can you move? We have so many things to discuss within the short period given me. Oh, what's happening? Prof, can you see my screen? Is it the slide you are talking about? Yeah, please move on. We'll come back to this later. Okay. Next slide, please. This one? Next one, next one. I'll come back to this later. The next slide should be the scope of speech language therapy. Um, okay, well. Please, let me discuss this one, then we go on. Now, the essence of this particular slide, you know, like I put it here, is to let us appreciate the nature of speech and how it engages several disciplines, okay? Involved either in studying speech as a phenomenon, okay? Or studying the speech impairment or treating or rehabilitating speech impairment. I've mentioned three things. Now, if you look at the speech and how important speech is to human being, like we have briefly mentioned, how it has now become a pivotal issue in the politics, in economy, in management, and in other various phases of life, you will realize that there are so many fields involved, many professions involved, many disciplines involved. Now, we will understand why is it so? If we look at speech at three dimensions, like I've mentioned, speech either as 
a phenomenon, a, a phenomenon itself. What do we mean by that is that the role speech plays in human life. Speech has become so vital, apart from the fact that it facilitates communication. It also dignifies human beings. In some culture, when somebody cannot speak very well, such fellow is usually um, reduced to the level of status of animal. Okay? But then, um, that is the more reason why every professional involved in speech language therapy must realize that they have a very important challenge at hand. Okay, so like I said, either study speech as a phenomenon itself or study the speech disorders, otherwise known as speech impairment, or rehabilitating, you know, you know, correcting speech errors. Now, when you take number one, for instance, you will also move. Um, please, there is a little problem there. Speech phenomenon, then you go to required discipline. So the discipline should move, uh, should be moved to um, required discipline. Now, if we talk about speech and communication as an instrument or a tool of communication, what are the fields involved? What are the professionals or uh, disciplines involved? You talk about linguistics, for instance. You talk about communication studies. They are there, they are involved. Again, speech is developmental. In other words, speech grows. You know, it's, an, it, 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 it's a complement of human development. It's one of the skills a child begins to acquire as he grows. And because it's also developmental, you find out that the field of education is involved, psychology is involved, and so on and so forth. Again, you look at number three, for instance. Speech is susceptible to impairment or to disorders. And because it's susceptible to the um, um, impairment or disorders, just like we have in the case of cleft, you know, um, lips and palate, you also have, because of that nature, certain professions are also involved. Medicine is involved, you know, rehabilitation is involved, um, special education, because um, um, speech disorders are also regarded as disabilities. So you have special education involved. And again, you also have technology involved. And again, you look at speech as a skill that is acquired. A child acquires or imitates speech from the environment where he grows up. And because it involves the environment, you know, the culture where he grows up, you have speech, I mean, sorry, you have fields like sociology involved, anthropology involved, uh, social linguistics, you know, involved, and so on and so forth. Why are we deliver, sorry, why are we spending time or doing much on this? It's to realize the connectivity, the importance, you know, the widespread of course, the, the, the phenomenon we call language, for the speech or language, which is almost so universal in nature and is what applies to everybody. Okay, please, can we move to next slide now? Next slide. Okay, fine. Now, Specifically now, we are centering on or zeroing on the scope of, um, okay, first, before we center on cleft. Please, I have mentioned that we can let, we can let, um, for now, we can let this one go. I will come back to it later. Please. Next slide is on the scope of SLT practice. You know, speech language. Wow, what is happening? Okay, let me discuss this one. Now, the, the, the scope of cleft speech therapy. Like I've mentioned earlier, you also find out here that professions that are involved in rehabilitating patients with cleft speech are also many okay first we have the speech therapist second surgery as a field or discipline is involved dentistry is involved psychology is involved 
audiology is also involved because we have now realized that because of the nature of the cleft, infection spread from his kitchen tip from the mouth also to the ear. And this creating hearing loss in the patient. So at times the audiologist or uh, the audiology as a profession also comes in. Okay, we have the nursing, we have the prosthesis, we have um, orthodontics, and so on and so forth. That shows how widespread, you know, the connectivity, the network of professionals involved in rehabilitating patients with cleft speech is. Um, patients, how involving, how widespread it is. Please, can we move on? Now, scope of SLT, speech language therapy. Practice. Scope of speech language therapy, please. We need to be very sequential. I will discuss all matters arising together. Uh, according to the slides you shared, this is the uh, the sequence of the slides. Which Thank one you are you requesting I, for? I have mentioned that, please, I will come back to. Um, I will come back to matters arising. It's better I discuss this all the This is the last arising. slide. Which slide are you talking about? Yeah, there is a slide on speech language practice. You know, the scope of SLT is just to buttress what I've mentioned before, you know. Um, thank this you very one? much. Yes, that one. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Again, this is just, um, you know, a diagram showing um, as a way of reinforcing what I've mentioned before. Now, what are the areas involved in speech language therapy practice? So we have a bit aphasia, for instance, um, which of course is a neurologic, you know, uh, problem. So we have swallowing problem resulting from um, even the cleft palate as well as the, the, the stroke patient, okay? We have the cleft palate and lips itself. We have what we call delayed speech. We have language disorder. We have autism. We have articulation disorder. We have stuttering, and we um, other people call stuttering stammering the same thing. You know whether you call it stuttering or stammering. Thank you very much. I think now we can now discuss all matters arising together. So I want to plead that please, can you go back to matters arising from the history after we discuss the matters of I mean arising from history. Then we move to matters arising from um, the first one. The first one. This is the last one. I'm sorry. Um, next slide back. Going back. Thank you very much. Now. From all discussion we had so far, we, oh, please let that slide stay. That's what I'm discussing now. Matters are rising from the history. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, what are some takeaways, you know, um, from what we've discussed? so far. Number one is that the flawless speech of functional language in a broader sense has become a must have skill in the modern day. What we are trying to say here is re-emphasizing the importance of effective communication, especially verbal communication, speech, which is quite very fundamental to human beings, like we have read from several literature that the only skill which distinguishes human beings from other animals, you know, is speech. All other things man do, or does rather, animals also do, okay? Now, we are also seeing that no communication disorder must be left untreated or uncorrected. You know, every communication disorder, whatever name it is, 
must be attended to, must be corrected, must be treated. Why? Because any untreated um, speech or language problems create communication problems. And like we have mentioned, communication is quite very important to human beings. Next is that medical procedures for cleft patients are means to an end and not end in themselves. What are we trying to say here is that from the moment we begin to discuss or plan surgery for patients with cleft lips or cleft palate, we must realize that we are just starting from the paradventure, the first stage of rehabilitation. And that is not the end. The end, of course, is that after we would have succeeded in finishing the tissue, you know, closing the opening, then there are still other assignments, particularly the need for that patient after surgery to be able to speak and speak acceptably. Okay? Now, if we are able to develop this mindset, then we should have um, the primary concern of all. Okay, what I'm trying to say is that this idea that surgery is not an aid but a means to an aid should be of primary concern to all multidisciplinary professionals I and mean professionals involved in cleft care. Okay, now again, we also need to realize another important thing. And that is, we must appreciate the fact that speech language as, um, therapy as well as cleft speech therapy is far more recent compared to other disciplines in terms of imaging. Okay? When you talk about medicine, medicine has taken centuries to come up. Dentistry, nothing. But when we talk about speech language, therapy, particularly the um, cleft speech therapy. They are quite very modern. I mean, recent. Let me use the word recent. Now, what does that mean? Is that as a result, there is a need for us to have this understanding and having this understanding should guide us to develop um, a sense of tolerance. Let me use that word. You know, understanding and patience because this is a new, more or less new development compared to other professions, you know, um, surrounding it. And therefore, the body of knowledge, for instance, you know, the practice, the skills are not yet as elaborate as what we have in medicine or what we have in uh, dentistry or what we have in nursing. Okay. So we should see it as a, a baby, still very tender, you know, calling for attention and interest. Okay. And one important issue from what I've just mentioned is that this particular area, cleft speech therapy, is calling for strong interest in research and clinical methodology, you know, methods, you know, in handling um, patients with cleft challenges. What that means is that there is a need for us to develop strong interest in research, you know, and clinical development um, in that area to make it improve, you know, to prom um, um, move forward, you know, promote research, promote knowledge, promote skills and practice in cleft speech management. Now, the last matter arising, please. We have discussed that of the history now. Now we are going to the matter arising from. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Now matters arising from cleft speech professional network. What are certain things we need to understand here? Is that cleft speech therapy requires a multidisciplinary service delivery. Now we have, you know, shown the different professions involved, different professions that are needed to have a comprehensive 
service delivery as far as treatment of patients with cleft speech um, is concerned. Then we also need to understand that not only do we need to appreciate the fact that it requires a multidisciplinary service, but also that the more comprehensive the service delivery team is, the better the service outcome. In other words, it's broad. And everybody involved is important. When we talk about comprehensive, we are talking about how widespread, how engaging the team is. I have stressed this before that everybody is important and we need to get everybody on board. If we have that comprehensive service continuum, then we can be sure or we can be expecting a better result. Next is that the more united, focused, and selfless the team members are, the better the result. Now, what I'm trying to say here is the need for creating synergy, understanding, unity, and remaining focused and again, selfless. The interest of the patient we are trying to rehabilitate should be of more importance than who we are or what our professions are. So unity, focus, and selflessness are quite very important, okay? Then we need to understand that rehabilitation of cleft patients often take more time and much um, effort. What I mean here is that there are a lot of, you know, um, meetings, conferences we have. All the teams are required. We look at the patient, every patient presents unique case. We examine, okay, the um, speech therapist looks at the situation, examines the child's you know, issue, um, the opening. How big is it? Is surgery the wisest decision to take? Or we should consider the prosthetic appliances? That may take time. And even then when a decision is reached, an action is taken. We follow up. And even after surgery or whatever, we also still follow up. So it takes time, you know meeting regularly and remaining committed, you know. So what we are trying to say is that it calls for dedication, you know, on the part of everybody in the book. And um, finally here, I think we can leverage on what this my train is doing to copy our colleagues um, or similar associations, similar professions, what they are, they are doing in uh, Europe and other parts of the world. Take, for instance, in America, we have what is called the American Cleft Palate you know, Penal uh, Pension Association. And because all parties, all professionals involved have come to realize the challenge, how huge the challenge is, and the need to have a united front, they've been able to form associations. You know, multiple professionals involved gathered together, just like you have mentioned, the American Cleft association, you know, it's, it, it's an example of what we can also do in this part of the world. And when we have such a, a body, it will be able to press for stronger training, research, treatment, and advocacy for cleft speech therapy in Nigeria. Thank you very much. I'd um, like to appreciate numerous people who have joined us who I cannot mention. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, Professor Julius Adimokoya, for giving us that detailed lecture on cleft speech therapy in the context of speech language practice. Thank you, sir. So please we'll welcome all questions in the question and answer box, please. Thank you. All questions should please go to the question and answer box. But for now, I have a question in the question and answer box that is in French. So please can interpreter for the French language 
try to interpret the question for us all. Thank you. Um, I can help on that because the interpreter will not be able to speak now. So the attendee was saying that, um, hello, my name is Priska Kabangu Chikudi, a final year medical student at the University of Kinshasa. I would like to know when speech and language therapy, at what age and how it is done. Okay, Professor, did you get that question? Well, I believe that question was asked in relation to uh, a child who has speech and flex speech, flex valid or leave. Hello, did you? I can hear you, sir. Yes, I said I believe that question is specifically referring to a patient with flex leap of palate. If that is correct, when should speech therapy begin for such a child? Um, like I briefly mentioned, the team involved of the first of all team, you know, I mean, I when should a child with flat problem go for surgery? Now, there is a school of thought which claims that the child should be as old as four years old before surgery is done. Because of certain reasons, you know, the growth of the child and the likelihood of success of the surgery, if done at that level of development. Now, once the surgery is done and the child recovers sufficiently. Of course, the surgeons will also determine, you know, um, whether the child has sufficiently recovered and the child is due for surgery. There is no way of saying that it's six months, one year, of two years after surgery. I've mentioned that every child presents or every patient presents unique case. It's not the same surgery requirement or extent of damage or extent of healing, you know. They are not the same for all the patients. What matters is when has the child or the fellow recovered sufficient uh, enough of therapy. That's what I can tell about that. Okay, sir. There's a okay. There's a question here for you. It says, "What? Which kind of obstacles are found during speech therapy programs? Which kind of obstacles are found during the speech therapy programs?" Thank you. Sir. Well, um, again, I'm still not clear whether this fellow is talking about speech language therapy generally or is specifically referring to flat station. The two are not the same. Obstacles we can have with a child who has undergone surgery and now is attending speech therapy session may involve number one, um, how successful, how accurate, how appropriate, how successful, how effective is the surgery itself is. That's number one. You know, the level of success recorded by the surgery is going to help the success in speech therapy. And again, if it is on the negative side, it's also going to constitute some challenges 
you know, for speech therapy. That is number one. Number two, um, again, is the fact that the patient his ability to get along with the speech therapy program, you know, as well as expected. Every child or every patient has some unique problem. For instance, age could be a problem. Okay, willingness of the patient to submit himself or herself for therapy is, a, is an issue. The cooperation and the support from the family is an issue. Again, don't also forget that most of the time we talk about surgery, surgery. Surgery is not the only problem. The fellow with cleft palate or lip heart. There are other problems. Okay, the feeding problems, for instance, the head status is also there. The degree of hearing loss, you know, infection that might have left some effect, no matter how temporary or permanent. So all these things must be taken holistically. And again, the comprehensiveness of the team involved. Okay, the prosthetics, for instance, the orthodontist, you know, everybody must actively play his own or our own role. When these things are done collectively and perfectly well, then you can expect less obstacles. But if, again, if they are not there, you can also expect good obstacles. Now, Having said that, we move to speech language um, practice at the Again, we have a lot of issues, of course. Um, take for instance, this morning I was, trying, I was reading a, a, a publication which placed the number of speech therapists in Nigeria, for instance, at 15. Well, we know we are more than that, but the issue is that we cannot vote, uh, we cannot vouch to say we are up to 200 speech therapists in this country. Even in America, the demand has always surpasses, I'm sorry, um, surpassed the supply. So how much more in a developing country like in Nigeria? So do we have adequate number of speech therapists to attend to speech challenges in this country? No. When you succeed in getting one, other problems come. Like I've mentioned, issues, you know, like cultural, I mean, cultural problems. For instance, many Nigerians still believe that suffering as challenging as it is, parents still believe that there are normal challenges a growing child must encounter. And without anything done, that child will have to grow it. Unfortunately, that is not true. Especially when it is no longer primary structure. When you are having a secondary structure, a child of 14, 15, um, anyway, um, a youth of his structure, and you say, um, that's how your father started. And uh, your father, out, uh, out. you know, the cultural issues are there. So many factors are there. Thank you very much, sir. There's another question here for you, a couple of questions, but I think we'll need to take it one at a time. Is every patient with cleft managed in Nigeria by a cleft team assessed by a speech therapist? Is every patient with cleft managed in Nigeria by a cleft team assessed by a speech therapist? So let's take that first before the two others. Uh, well, that's a quite very interesting question. Um, sincerely speaking, let me be very open to you. I have not personally taken it as a, re as a responsibility to follow up each patient um, taking care by smile. Maybe after the surgery, he then move to speech therapy session. I have not done that. But if I'm to answer that question, I would say probably no. It's not likely because of certain factors. Um, I think one of the challenges we have to also deal with is to create a follow-up program um, um, system where we make sure that a patient after surgery or you know, pro, uh, prosthetic appliance doesn't just fizzle out into the public. Like I said, surgery or any other 
measures taken before the speech therapy, they are not in them. They are rather means to end. The end is that these patients must also be trained to acquire intelligible, you know, quality. So until when we get to that level, that we do not lose patients after speech, I'm mean, sorry, after surgery, um, we are also able to have tracking systems that pick them up and also lead them straight for speech therapy. I, I think um, our efforts are not important. Okay, once we are able to put good tracking system in place. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. I think the other two questions also hang on the first one. Is it because we are missing trained personnel or because CLEF teams do not understand the importance of multidiscipline in the management of patients or a bit of both or other reasons? What can be done to ensure that every child with a CLEF is assessed by a speech therapist in Nigeria? I have to take both because of time. Thank you. No, please, can you repeat the question? I didn't get you properly. Okay, the first question I asked was, is every patient with cleft managed in Nigeria by a cleft team assessed by a speech therapist? If not, is it because we are missing trained personnel or because cleft teams do not understand the importance of multidiscipline in the management of patients or a bit of both or other reasons? What can be done to ensure that every child with a cleft is assessed by a speech therapist in Nigeria? Yeah, well, the way I can answer this question is um, one, by agreeing that because of inadequate numbers of speech therapists available in Nigeria, you may have the challenge that every patient with cleft may not be opportune to have a speech therapist attending to him or her. That is one. But even then, when the speech therapist is available, the cultural issue we are still battling with as a developing nation is still here. It is not every patient, it is not every parent, it is not every um, person that has come to realize the importance of speech therapy after surgery. This, um, 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 the, the problem of cleft itself, once you are able to bridge the gap, I mean, and make the fusion, correct the problem of the case, the patient um, deformity, some of them think, oh, that's okay. I'm okay. Now I look better. I look fine. I look acceptable. What else? I'm okay. So many have not yet come to realize that the speech problem already created by cleft is still there. It must be corrected. It is not only now that you have a good face, you know, cosmetic face and beautiful, you know. As long as you cannot still speak, you know, intelligibly, effectively, you know, flawlessly, you still have another social problem. So we are yet to come to that. And I think on the part of the speech therapist, you know, we have a lot of um, public enlightenment, a lot of work to do, you know, to educate our society. And that's what we've been doing over the years since um, Span came on, you know, came on board. Uh, but the fact is that we still have a, a long way to go. Well, the other aspect that, um, you know, the multidisciplinary matter, I don't want to lay blame on anybody. I've mentioned that the history of even the speech therapy and speech language therapy practice itself, you know, and let, you know, the history is very recent especially in a developing country like our own. We are still growing. And that's why I really appreciate, you know, the effort of the side tree in bringing all of us together. For instance, this may be a first time we are having a kind of, you know, um, uniting different professions involved, you know, in the treatment and rehabilitation of the cleft case. The 
first mind came, I'm not too sure. Anyway, pardon my ignorance if they have been before. Um, maybe even if they have, they have been, they may not have, they may not have, may not have been as comprehensive, you know, as intensive as we have been doing it here. So I give it to this man. Um, if we take time for us to understand the need for us, you know, to come together, to synergize, you know, together, and to grow together, to appreciate the crucial role of every professional. And I think more and more of um, SMI initiatives will be required. Thank you very much, sir, for all the questions answered. In the absence of in the absence of any other question, I would like to. Okay, no other question. Okay, I would like to return the webinar back to the chairperson. Over to you, please. Thank you, everyone, for being part of the Teleclet series today. We appreciate you and we know you've learned one or two things from this um, lectures today. We thank you for being part of it. See you next week, Monday, for another interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Bye. Excuse me, Victoria. Can we take this last question? I'm seeing a new one in the question and answer box. Please. Thank you. Okay, the okay, moderator, so can you take over? Okay. There's a new question coming in. It said, it's evident that multidisciplinary approach is very important in managing cleft speech therapy. However, a few sister professions know about SPAN. So what's being done by SPAN to propagate this profession? I don't know if we get that question. It's evident that oh, multidisciplinary okay. approach. Yeah. Go ahead, Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Spam, the speech pathologists and audiologists association in Nigeria, you know, um, over the years have been doing a lot of sensitization, um, public awareness, you know, emphasizing the partnership, the cooperation, you know, the, the, the collaboration needed among different professionals involved, you know, either in the management of hearing problem or in the management of speech language problem. Well, um, if you ask me what we've been doing, that may take another lecture and um, more than two hours to mention. But I like to stress that we've been organizing yearly programs, you know, apart from training our members, you know, upgrading them, upgrading their knowledge and um, ensuring that the professional competence required of them, you know, is promoted. We have also been engaging in a lot of collaboration, you know, um, partnership. Every year when we have our annual conference, we make it as a duty to invite otorhinolaryngologists to come and speak. We have reached out to people in the um, linguistic and um, 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 language communication. In fact, we have as honorary members, our colleagues who are in, from the Department of Linguistics, you know, um, language or languages and their communication studies. We also have from the psychology, we have from technology because we also know technology is involved. Let me also say that SPAM is um, an active member of the Medical Rehabilitation Therapist Board of Nigeria. Um, by uh, being a member there, we have good working relationship with physiotherapists, um, prosthetics, um, um, orthotics, unoccupational you know, therapists, and so on. It's out of that annual programs, reaching out to the public and also reaching out to different professions involved that SMI got to know about us. <laughs> and um, we will keep on doing that because we know that we fall into a wider helping profession. 
you know, healing profession, so to say. We have a lot of sister associations. We are reaching out, to, um, you know, also to other countries and so on. But then, in every sense of it, either as far as professions are concerned, or either as um, geographical, you know, connectivity is also needed. We are reaching out. We are doing as much as we can, and we promise we can continue to do more and more. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the answer to that question. And I believe we all get what you said. Thank you. Ms. Victoria, please. Thank you, everyone. In the absence of no other questions, we we'll say thank you for attending today's section of Teleclerk. See you again next week, Monday, for an interesting topic. Thank you and bye.